So this lecture today is about gastrointestinal dysfunction, gastrointestinal disorders in the pediatric population. Some of it is stuff we experience in adults as well. Some of it is congenital, um, but there are various disorders that we will talk about. So when we're talking about malabsorption disorders. Malabsorption disorders are fairly common and it's a broad category. Malabsorption disorders are often your intolerances and your allergies. And because the intestine is so irritated by whatever it doesn't tolerate, it doesn't then absorb those nutrients either. So not only do you have the symptoms of gastrointestinal distress such as potentially vomiting, diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, um, abdominal pain. Um, it's also not absorbing these things. Um, so there's several different ones. A lot of times people think of milk intolerance or milk allergies even, um, but the most common one that we're going to focus on right now is celiac disease. And this is where you have a gluten allergy, gluten intolerance. Um, it varies widely in in intensity. Some people um, just have um, some abdominal pain and diarrhea all the way up to people can have bloody diarrhea and severe intolerance um, to the point that they get so such severe malabsorption that they develop failure to thrive, which is where they're not gaining weight appropriately. Um, especially you'll see that in infants and sometimes that can be the first sign of it. Um, so with celiac disease, this is related to gluten. Um, gluten is not all carbohydrates. A lot of times people want to th associate celiac with carbs in general, um, and it's not. It's very specific ones, and you see them on the screen. It is underlined, so that's probably important for you to know the specific things that are off limits to people with celiac disease. It's wheat, barley, oats, and rye. They can eat potatoes, they can eat corn, they can eat some of those other carbohydrate um, products, but these are the ones they cannot eat. Um, with the explosion of gluten um, familiarity in the population, people are using it not just as a um, intolerance, but just to avoid gluten for, for dietary reasons. Um, you're seeing many, many more products that are gluten-free um, on the market, which is really good for these patients that truly can't tolerate gluten. Um, it can be anything from, a, if it, um, it has to be a large amount of gluten for them to eat, to have problems, all the way to some people with severe intolerances. It can be to where if they eat something that was processed in the same plant as um, the product they're eating, it can cause problems. Um, so oftentimes in infants, um, they may have failure to thrive. Um, they may be really irritable just because their stomach usually is is hurting. They they don't feel well. Um, their stools, um, and this goes with a lot of malabsorption problems. They're often large, bulky, possibly frothy, possibly blood in the stool, and this is because of that intestine not absorbing that food. So it's all kind of coming out and not getting digested. Um, celiac disease is diagnosed with um, either a small bowel biopsy or they'll look for the IgA in the in the blood. Um, so the, the only treatment for celiac disease as well as all malabsorption disorders is just avoidance of whatever the problem food is. So in this case, these patients cannot eat products that contain wheat, barley, oats, or rye. Um, it is often lifelong. This isn't, it's some, there are some malabsorption disorders like you'll see with milk intolerance. Sometimes children will grow out of that as they get older. This is one that typically children don't grow out of. It's going to be a lifelong treatment plan of dietary restriction. So one big thing we see in pediatrics that I know you know about in adults as well as dehydration. So the definition of dehydration is where there's a greater loss of fluid than there is fluid going in. And there's various reasons that can cause this. A lot of times vomiting and diarrhea is the first thing that comes to mind. Um, it could be insensible fluid losses. For instance, fever is a huge, huge cause of dehydration in children. Um, first 
several reasons. One, uh, the increased cardiac workload that goes with the tachycardia um, increases their, their fluid use. Sweating that happens as that temperature is coming down. Even the tachypnea that they have, the increased respiratory rate leads to them breathing off more fluid. So fever is a huge cause of dehydration in ill children. Um, there's various other reasons as well, such as burns um, and things like that. Um, children have a much higher percentage of their body as water, um, so they are more greatly affected by dehydration. Oftentimes, like in a lot of things that happen in pediatrics, they will compensate for a long time. Their symptoms may be a little more um, vague um, and subtle, and then by the time you really see those severe symptoms, they are severely dehydrated and need IV fluids. Um, so some of the common symptoms we see in children um, are, especially as it gets more severe, the, their cap refill will be delayed because their perfusion is delayed. It's shunting blood away from their extremities. Uh, a big thing we look at in younger children is if they're crying and there's no tears. Like for instance, we're trying to start an IV and they're crying and they're upset, but there's no tear production. Um, decrease uh, urine output. That's with adults as well as children. Um, when we're talking about children, the typical urine output um, in infants, it's a little bit higher because we've talked about like with newborns, their kidneys are immature and they can't concentrate urine the way we do. So in order to excrete the waste products that they need, typically their urine output is going to be a little bit higher per kilogram. Um, so infants are going to be one to two milliliters per kilogram per hour, and then older children, it decreases to a half to one milliliter per kilogram per hour. So a little bit higher in infants that you would expect. Um, but the big thing we look at, like we talked about six to eight wet diapers a day shows adequate nutri um, adequate intake in an infant. We'll often go by that just like in adults once they hit um, that six to eight hour mark without voiding, then we're going to start looking at why, what's going on that's making them go so long without voiding. Um, so some of the other things that we'll see as late signs in infants, you may see that sunken fontanelle, which is what you can see in the picture. I don't know how well you can notice that, but if you see in the middle of the head, that anterior fontanelle is, you can see the outline of the edges of their skull bones. Um, that could be a sign. Um, changes in vital signs. So just like adults, their BP, their blood pressure will drop, um, heart rate, respiratory rate will go up. Um, something that we don't typically use in pediatrics that is reliable as it is in adults is skin turgor. Um, if they have reduced skin turgor, that's usually a pretty late sign in a child um, because their skin is more um, flexible than than adults. It's more pliable. Um, you, you don't see that skin turgor until a late sign. Now in your textbook, there is a chart that outlines um, dehydration as far as mild, moderate to, to severe, it outlines the percentage of fluid loss that relates to each category, as well as the symptoms you see. I would highly recommend you know the symptoms associated with mild, moderate to severe, as well as what you do about it. For instance, mild fluid loss or mild dehydration is what we consider 5% of volume loss. Um, and this is gonna be things like thirst, maybe a little bit irritable, things like that, versus severe is going to be 15% loss. This is where you're going to have lethargy. Um, you may start having sunken eyes. That's another thing we'll see in kids. You may have the oliguria. Um, so these are more severe. So what do we do about it? You should know what you do about the each individual stages as well. So mild dehydration, you're probably just going to give them Oral rehydration solution. I want you to know that term, not Gatorade, not Pedialyte, but oral rehydration solution. That is what you will hear. Um, so oral rehydration solution is not water. It is something that has electrolytes in it to keep them um, hydrated as well as to replace any electrolytes lost. So under the age of two, years of age. They should only have Pedialyte. Um, Gatorade, because of its concentrations of sodium, are too hard on the kidneys for children that young. Um, in a pinch, you could always dilute Gatorade, um, but it's better to stick with Pedialyte. So under the age of two is Pedialyte. Over the age of two is when you can use like Powerade, Gatorade, things like that. Um, 
Again, I want you to associate the term oral rehydration solution, not brand names, because that's not what you're going to see on the NCLEX. You're going to see the generic term of oral rehydration solution. So in mild cases, even in moderate cases, if they're able to tolerate fluids, um, they're going to try oral rehydration first. Um, we're not just automatically going to jump to the IV. Now, if you're talking about severe um, sunken fontanelles, lethargic, lack of tears, oliguria, all those kinds of things, you're automatically going to jump to IV fluids. Um, when we give boluses of IV fluids, where we give a large amount at one time, the um, category is the same for, or the configuration is the same for children as well as an adult. Um, we give 20 milliliters per kilogram, and we'll give it over anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, depending on how severe it is um, and how fast your pump can go. Sometimes if it's a, a, an older child, um, most pumps you can't set higher than 999, um, so if your pump won't go any faster than that, you just go with however fast the pump will go. Um, if they have any kind of cardiac issues, renal issues, or even sometimes with infants, especially very young infants, they'll cut that back to 10 milliliters per kilogram um, just so it's not as hard on the body. See how they react and maybe give them another 10 milliliters per kilogram, but just do it at once at a time. So how do we know how much fluid they need? Well, that's where your maintenance fluid calculations come in. We actually do use this in practice, um, especially when we're titrating kids and trying to get them to take more oral intake um, as they're feeling better, especially with your GI illnesses. Um, as they are drinking more, we will taper down their IV fluids. But you got to know how much they're supposed to get in a 24-hour period in order to determine what to cut their IV fluids back to based on how much they're drinking. Um, so we will go over these in class. Um, there is also a video posted on Blackboard. I have practice questions uploaded on Blackboard um, as well as there are maintenance fluid calculations on that ATI dosage calculation homework assignment you did way back in the beginning of the class. Um, so I encourage you to review those and we'll talk about it in class as well and I'll show you a chart method of how you can lay it out and sometimes that's easier for people to figure out. Um, but we got to know how much they get once they get that bolus to give them a boost, then we got to give them maintenance fluids and making sure they're sticking um, within those maintenance um, requirements based on their weight. So you should know, um, and it outlines it in the book in a chart, um, mild, moderate versus severe symptoms as well as what do you do with it. Um, also make sure you recognize the term oral rehydration solution. So a common cause of dehydration, especially in children, is diarrhea. It is one of the most common causes of illness in children, especially under the age of five. Um, there are various things that can cause it. I've listed a few on the screen. Um, a lot of times we don't know the actual culprit unless you do a stool sample and unless they have diarrhea for several days, they're not going to do an, a stool sample. And the reason for this is because 99% of the time it is a virus and there's nothing you can really do about it except for wait it out and keep them hydrated. Um, one of the um, exceptions to that is Clostridium difficile or C. diff is what you often hear called. That one we do treat with oral vancomycin. Vancomycin is normally always given IV, but this is one case where it actually works directly inside the gut um, for that C. diff or Clostridium difficile. Um, but most of them are viruses, so there's nothing to do for them as other than making sure they stay hydrated, um, as well as making sure we don't give antidiarrheals. Diarrheals should antidiarrheals should never be given, and this is in adults as well as children. And the reason for this is, if you anything that runs, whether you have a runny nose, whether you have runny stools, um, is your body's way of kind of flushing things out that are making you sick. Um, if you stop that flushing out, your body's natural defense of trying to get rid of whatever's making it sick, then the bacteria are just going to multiply. So you don't want to stop that body's natural process of trying to get rid of what is making you sick. Um, so the priority action when we're talking about patients with diarrhea is hydration. Um, 
in practice, we're not really worried about food intake. Um, they're not going to get emaciated and, and lose weight in a matter of a couple days to the point that we're concerned. Um, but hydration, you can absolutely get severely dehydrated. It only takes three to four days of lack of fluids to die from lack of hydration. So hydration is really what we focus on more so than food intake. Um, I know plenty of you have probably heard of the BRAT diet um, that we often use for diarrhea. It stands for bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. Um, current recommendations are they don't recommend the BRAT diet because it does not provide um, enough nutritional substance though just eating those foods um but again in practice we're not really worried about nutrition if it's only a couple days we're more worried about hydration so um in practice we do still use the brat diet because it helps soften i mean it helps firm up the stool give the stool bulk um and slow down some of that diarrhea but recommendations for testing purposes ati NCLEX, all this stuff is the BRAT diet is not recommended because of it doesn't provide enough nutritional substance. But again, your priority is hydration. Um, that oral rehydration therapy or oral rehydration solution um, is how we're going to hydrate them for most patients unless they're severely dehydrated. And then we'll look at IV um, forms. So it, another thing, going back to C. diff, and hopefully all y'all know this with C. diff, um, Clostridium difficile is a spore-producing bacteria, which means it does not get affected by hand sanitizer. So a lot of times in practice, we will, if a patient has diarrhea, we will wash our hands with soap and water, especially if we don't know the cause, because C. diff can only be sanitized I guess you would say with soap and water friction um, and time it, it is not affected by alcohol rubs the spores survive so hand washing with any kind of diarrheal just for your own practice knowledge it is a good idea um, so when we're rehydrating these patients um, Oral rehydration therapy is great because it gives you fluids um, and it gives you electrolytes, but it also has a lot of sugar. Um, and the problem with sugar is sugar increases diarrhea. Um, so this is why they don't recommend things like apple juice and jello and things like that in large amounts when a patient has diarrhea because that sugar will make it worse. Um, and sometimes like especially Gatorade, not so much Pedialyte, but Gatorade has a lot of sugar in it. So when, when given at full strength, strength, that can even increase diarrhea. So being um, mindful of the sugar um, count in these products that we're giving them. So another important thing with diarrhea is prevention. Um, it seems like no matter how much you sanitize, you just can't prevent the spread of these. But there are ways to minimize the spread. One with rotavirus is getting children vaccinated. They get two, um, two, three rotavirus vaccines, depending on the schedule the doctor uses. So making sure they're getting those rotavirus vaccines as an infant, um, teaching personal hygiene to patients, keeping patients, most patients that have have diarrhea um, that's noted as part of their medical reason for being admitted will um, often be put on contact precautions. And, and it's a good idea to maintain those contact precautions um, because just because there's not a stool on a surface doesn't mean that bacteria is not living there or that virus is not living there, whichever it is. Um, other things is teaching appropriate food preparation, food storage, making sure there's clean water, protecting from contamination, things like like this to help prevent some of those diarrheal illnesses um, in our country. Um, children don't typically die from diarrhea, but in developing countries, about a quarter of um, deaths in children are related to some kind of diarrheal illness. So um, it can definitely result from poor water sources and poor food preparation and storage and things like that. Um, so with diarrhea, rehydration is your primary concern. So 
On the other end of the spectrum, we have constipation. Constipation is extremely common in children. Um, the two most common ages we see come in with constipation is your toddler slash preschool age when they're learning how to go to the bathroom. Oftentimes, they have potty anxiety, um, so they'll hold it throughout the day, um, or they're just figuring out how to go. So that can lead to constipation. Another population we see it commonly in is, is your adolescents because they're too ashamed shame to go poop in school so they will hold it all day and it creates a um, pattern in their body of not going and it resulting in constipation. So when we're talking about constipation, um, generally they, they say is if you have trouble for at least two weeks, um, but it can take just a few days before you start to feel symptoms. Oftentimes symptoms that patients will note is uh, abdominal pain, um, cramping. Um, they will have hard stools. They may even, do, even children can get hemorrhoids from especially chronic constipation. Um, so the best way to manage constipation is diet, fiber, fluids, and exercise. I know you've heard that before. Um, in your book, it talks about the fiber content of foods, um, good sources of fiber. I recommend you learn those, um, what is constitutes good sources of fiber um, for patients. Um, so when they need treatment now, there's various options that we do. Typically, we do the two-ended route. Um, so we will give them an enema. And we will put them on Miralax for a few days. <clears throat> and the reason for the enema is you can't keep pushing everything down if you don't pop the cork. And that's the way our doctors always describe it. you got to pop the cork or get the hard stool out of the rectum before you can start pushing things through with the Miralax or any kind of laxatives. Um, when they get admitted, some of you have been with me at the hospital when we've had patients with constipation that are there for what we call a clean out. Um, they will often have orders of go lightly until clear. If you've never seen go lightly, um, it's actually the exact same thing as Miralax. It's the same ingredient, just given in a larger quantity. Um, so we they will get go lightly. Um, oftentimes children can't tolerate drinking that much by mouth so we'll put an ng tube in so that they're getting it pretty pretty high amounts um one thing we found with pediatrics um they switched up our regimen going back to it's the same thing as miralax um we were having problems with children dropping their electrolytes once they started having um the the liquid diarrhea stools from the miralax so we actually switched up the regimen to instead of miralax mixed with water we would use a gallon of gatorade and put a whole bottle the 15 dose bottle in a gallon of Gatorade and that would give them some of those electrolytes back as well. Now granted it's going through their body pretty quickly but it gives them something and we found it wasn't dropping their electrolytes quite as much. So if you need a home method um, you can always use Miralax with um, a gallon of Gatorade or even water. Um, but the big thing with constipation, fiber, fluids, exercise, as well as bowel training, especially in children, um, getting them to um, go when they feel the urge, not holding it or being embarrassed, things like that. So one thing that can cause constipation in children as an initial sy sy symptom is called Hirschsprung's disease. It's congenital. Children are born with it. So what happens with this? Um, if you look at the picture on the right-hand side of the screen, the, the mega colon you see or the big, large, distended colon is not where the problem is. It's down below it where you see the little, tiny, skinny colon. That's the problem. There's no um, ganglion cells going to that section of bowel. Um, so because of that, there's no peristalsis. If you don't have nerves going to a portion of the body, then you're not going to have muscle movement. And that's what happens. It takes away that normal peristalsis. So everything backs up behind it. Um, oftentimes the first sign you may see is that they don't end up having um, a meconium stool as an infant. That can be one of the first signs. Um, we, we talked about with newborns, there's various things they'll look at if you don't have that meconium stool within 24 to 48 hours. And this is one of those things that can occur um, that they may consider if they're not having um, 
that meconium stool in the beginning. Um, sometimes it's not as severe um, to where they're not completely having a stool. Sometimes they'll have ribbon-like stools because it, they're coming out very thin because the intestine is not expanding to accommodate that bulk and to push it through. Um, on page 1184 in your textbook, it does talk about those symptoms, um, but a big symptom is that chronic constipation, distended colon behind the, the, the area that does not have that the ganglions to permit peristalsis. So what do we do about this? Well, the only thing that can be done about this, you can't add the nerves back to the portion of where the bowel is missing, so you have to do surgical management, and this is a two-step process. So the first process is they will get a temporary ostomy or colostomy, um, and they'll, they'll have this usually a couple months or so um, until their bowel, um, they start establishing that, getting rid of that megacolon and establishing bowel moving along. Um, and then they'll do a second stage, which is called a rectal pull through. So they take the end of the good bowel and pull it down and attach it to the anus. So it bypasses, they've taken out that section of bowel that was no good, and they're basically bypassing it and connecting um, that good bowel down to the anus so that they can function properly. Every kid I've had that's had this two-step process has done very well with it. Um, it typically has good outcomes with this and they don't continue to have problems because the portion of the bowel that was affected is now gone. Um, I can't get videos to pull up correctly um, when I do recordings, but if you look on the right hand side of the screen where it says second stage pull through you see is in a light blue color if you click on that it will show you a picture of the surgery where they're pulling down that bowel and you can see as they're pulling the bowel down through the anus you see the, the bad part where it's rather shriveled up um, and then you see the good part where it looks nice and healthy um, I will show this in class as well as we have time um, but if you want to you and you're following along with the slides um, going click on that that video it's a pretty good video especially if you have interest in doing OR it, it, you'll probably enjoy it but there's no other treatment for that other than taking out the affected section of bowel and they don't have to continue to have treatment after that so another um, congenital abnormality you may see is called a tracheoesophageal fistula, or TEF, we'll call it. Um, the picture shows you the different types of TEF. I don't want you to memorize the different anomalies. Um, the biggest, because they, they vary from child to child. Um, as you know, in normal anatomy, the esophagus and the trachea are two totally separate entities. They never cross each other. Well, during fetal development, in this case, they cross somewhere. It can be where the esophagus comes down from the mouth and connects with the trachea. It could be where the esophagus comes up from the at, from the stomach and it connects, or it could be connected in a couple places. It could be a blind pouch with the esophagus where it just stops, like you see in the middle picture on the top. Um, and so every time they eat, it's not going anywhere and they just vomit. Um, so signs you should know are highlighted or, or, or underlined and in bold, coughing, choking, cyanosis, and apnea, especially if they have a connection with the trachea because if it's connected, everything they eat just goes right into their trachea where, of course, you don't want that because then they can get um, aspiration pneumonia and things like that. So when we're taking care of these kids, once it's discovered that this is the problem, they are NPO um, and they will get a lot of times TPN or total parenteral nutrition until this can be fixed. Um, so treatment of this is surgery. There's no other way to treat it where they will separate the trachea and the esophagus. Um, unfortunately, I've only had a couple children I've had with this and they did not do well. One died from aspiration pneumonia. Even um, once they had separated the two, she was still having problems um, with aspiration. So um, surgical repair is the only way these children can survive, um, but sometimes it does not turn out with the best outcomes. 
So if you hear of a tracheoesophageal fistula, this is what it is. Coughing, choking, cyanosis, apnea, all of those are symptoms of potentially this problem. And then they'll do um, an investigation to see if this is what's causing it. And the only treatment is a surgical procedure to separate the two. So gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, you all often hear it called. Um, this is not always necessary, necessarily a lifetime problem. You see it a lot in infants, especially uh, premature infants. It's pretty common. Um, there are some typical symptoms that people think of, for instance, um, spitting up or even vomiting, fussiness, things like that, difficulty sleeping. Um, but you can also have silent reflux. Silent reflux. Um, my son had silent reflux when he was five weeks old. I took him to the doctor for wheezing, um, and it wasn't even respiratory season yet. So they did an RSV cold, uh test and it was negative they said just watch him kind of blew me off um went back again to another provider this time they at least um put him on a buterol nebs but they're like oh he's probably has some viral illness and and um that's the problem so finally when i went to a third provider after going through this for about four weeks at that point um they said, um, they had, they asked me all the right questions. I was going in thinking maybe it is something respiratory. Maybe he's got like reactive airway disease. Um, but when I was asking about albuterol and adding maybe some homocort or budesonide to that to, to help calm his lungs down, she asked me all the questions. She said, does he spit up? Uh, does he have trouble sleeping? Is he fussy a lot? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so she's like, I think he has reflux and that is causing his wheezing. Um, within two days of being put on famotidine or pepsid, um, symptoms disappeared. Um, so you can have what we call silent reflux as well and they may have more respiratory symptoms or fussiness where you don't outwardly see the the vomiting or the spitting up another symptom you may see is weight loss um it may not seem like they're spitting up that much but if they're spitting up with every feed they're not getting as much as you would want them to um, and they can actually start having weight loss or just not gaining weight the way you want them to um, the symptoms are outlined in your textbook as well as ATI as well um, to, to show those symptoms, um, but most of them are things like vomiting or spitting up, wheezing, weight loss, things like that. Um, so there's various different treatment methods that can be used. Um, the biggest one we teach patients is to keep them upright for at least 30 minutes after a feeding. Um, frequent burping, usually the recommendation is after every ounce of formula, they should be burped well and make sure they burp because um, any air in the stomach increases the volume in the stomach and doesn't allow the food to, to settle down. Um, also giving smaller, more frequent feedings helps as well. Instead of giving them a big eight ounce bottle, make it a four ounce bottle, but just give it to them more often. Their body can can tolerate it a little bit better. Um, another thing that sometimes doctors will do is adding cereal to the formula. And um, we talked about this with growth and development and nutrition and things like this. Under normal circumstances, for cereal is never recommended to be added to formula um, because it can be a choking hazard um, and it can it also um, can lead to too much weight gain because it is extra calories but in this case children with severe reflux they may um, recommend adding cereal to the formula um, to make it a little bit heavier so it's less likely to come up um, Another thing to mention, I mentioned upright after feedings. This is not in a car seat. They should not be sleeping in a car seat. I know this is a recommendation always for all kids, um, but a big reason specifically to reflux um, why you don't want them in a car seat is if you've ever noticed how a baby sits in a car seat, they're not straight. Their back is not straight. They're curved a little bit. So, and it's just slightly, but they are curved a little bit for comfort, which puts added pressure on that stomach. Um, 
increasing their risk of reflux. So it should be on, um, we, we have way, we tell parents to elevate the mattress of the bed, for instance, put something under the mattress um, as a way for them to sleep. We have slings, they can put them in to hold them upright, um, various different things. Um, as far as medications, the American Academy of Pediatrics does not recommend use of medications like Pepsid, Reglan, things like that um, for the treatment of reflux in, in infants. Um, they say because it is a common thing that oftentimes infants grow out of um, and these other more conventional methods are effective and it's not necessary to give them these medications. I personally disagree only because um, I, as well as lots of parents I've talked to, um, it can really be a lifesaver in the comfort of that child. Even when you're doing all those other conventional methods, it still is making them uncomfortable. Um, so Pepsid for me was a lifesaver. So test wise, American Academy of Pediatrics does not recommend medications like Pepsid, but oftentimes prescribers still pre prescribe them because they are effective. So when we're talking about reflux, what is your priority education for the parents? So we talked about educating them to decrease the reflux symptoms, but even more important to teach them is infant CPR because of that risk of aspiration and choking. Um, priority training at discharge with any patient that has reflux is infant CPR um, because it can potentially lead to cyanosis and choking. So another thing, gastrointestinal disorder that is congenital that you see in children is called pyloric stenosis is usually what you hear it called as. It is more common in boys than girls. Um, it does seem to have a familial um, tendency. You'll see siblings that have it or if maybe dad had it, their children are more likely to get it. There's not a specific gene connected to it, but it does seem to run in families. So what happens with pyloric stenosis is that pyloric sphincter that, could, that connects between your stomach and your small intestine that regulates the output of food from your stomach so it doesn't all just dump into your intestine is too tight. So if you see in the picture um, in A, it's just too tight and it's kind of clamping that off and not allowing food to go out. So typically the, the most notable symptom that you will see is projectile vomiting and it usually doesn't start at birth. It usually starts around six weeks of age or so, maybe four weeks. Um, so oftentimes they will have projectile vomiting with hunger. So they vomit, they scream because they're hungry, you feed them, they vomit, so on and so forth. So projectile vomiting with signs of hunger is your big symptom. They can also have abdominal distension where um, their, their abdomen is um, or where their stomach is not tolerating um, not having anything. Another thing that you may see, they may have like an olive shaped lump over that mid epigastric area where that pyloric um, sphincter is. Um, but the most notable one is that projectile vomiting with hunger. Um, for this one, the only treatment method is, again, surgery. Um, so they'll do what's called a pyloromyotomy, and they basically cut that muscle so that it can expand and open up. It's a fairly easy procedure. Every child I've had that's had this done has done very well, um, and it's not going to be a continued problem later on. So post-op, your post-op priorities as a nurse, um, pain medication. They just had surgery, so they're going to have pain. And also progressing their diet. Um, so they will usually start on clear fluids um, and they'll have a progression. So clear fluids and then we'll dilute it maybe 25% formula with 75% oral rehydration solution. As they tolerate that, we'll, we'll up the concentration of formula until they're on full formula or breast milk, depending on what they're taking. Um, 
And it's often not a linear progression. They don't continue to tolerate. Often the kids I've seen, they'll tolerate, tolerate, and then they vomit, and you have to go backwards a little bit. And and eventually you do get to the, the full formula, um, but it, it can take some time. Um, another thing we do, and this is a great example of that maintenance fluid titration, basically, um, is once you know, let's say your child needs 1,200 milliliters of fluid in a day, you determine based on their weight. Um, as they're drinking more, you decrease their IV fluid. So if they've had 600 mLs of fluids um, that they have taken, then you only need to give them 600 through their IV. And, and as they're drinking more and more, you can decrease their IV fluids. But monitoring and maintaining those IV fluids until they're tolerating um, is one of your priorities, as well as pain management. So another thing we see in children, this can happen in adults as well, but it's pretty uncommon in adults. This is usually something you see in children. This is not congenital. This is something that can just happen. And intussusception is where the um, intestine basically telescopes in on itself. So it pulls itself into itself. It most commonly happens at the interjection between the small intestine and the large intestine, but can happen anywhere within the intestines. Um, so it just happens. There's no known cause. There doesn't seem to be a genetic um, commonality with this. It, it's one of those things that just happens. Um, so the clinical manifestations are discussed in your book as well as ATI. The big one you should know is red currant jelly-like stools. So they're going to have bloody stools. So red currant jelly-like. Um, and the jelly is from the mucus, from the irritation. So what happens with this as that intestine gets stuck inside of itself, it's going to swell because it's irritated. It's traumatized. And all your body sees is we need to send all these mast cells and everything to the site to help with it. Swelling happens. As swelling happens, it gets tighter. As it gets tighter, it's going to cut off blood flow to that intestine, and that intestine can die. Um, so it is important to notice it. So most typically, the symptoms that you will see are periods of intense abdominal pain um, is how they will notice it at first, along with the red current jelly-like stools. Um, so the way to diagnosis is an air enema. So it's exactly what it sounds like. It's um, instead of using a fluid enema to get out um, your stool, like with constipation, using air. And what it hopefully will do is kind of push that piece out um, so that it returns to normal bowel function. If you look on that middle column um, in light blue, it says therapeutic management. This is a short video showing you what that air enema looks like on x-ray, and you can see as the problem gets reduced where it, it pushes the contrast through. Um, it's a pretty good video. It's a quick video, so you might have to watch it a couple times um, as, it, as it goes through. Um, so if an air enema doesn't work, surgery is required, but most of the time it does correct um, with that air enema or even spontaneously. Um, I had a, a child in the ER while we were waiting for the team to come in to do the air enema. It spontaneously resolved. And the way you know it has resolved, one, they, they'll stop having the abdominal pain. Um, and two, they will return to having a normal stool. So once they have a normal formed brown stool, they're good. They can go home. Um, it, once a patient does have an intussusception, they're more likely to get one later on. Um, but there's no like familial commonality with this. And the last topic we're going to talk about, which hopefully all of you are pretty familiar with because you discussed this back in MedSurg 1, um, is appendicitis. So the appendix is this little hangy thingy that, that's at that ileocecal valve in between the small intestine and the large intestine. Um, and what happens is bacteria or food or whatnot gets trapped in there um, and it develops an acute inflammation and infection.
Um, so the clinical manifestations are outlined in your book as well as ATI, but the big one that everybody thinks of is right lower quadrant pain. This right lower quadrant is also known as McBurney's point. So when you hear pain at McBurney's point, that's what it's talking about, that right lower quadrant. Another thing specifically with the pain is often they will have what's called rebound pain. So it's not just when you press, but then when you let go with the palpation, they will have intense pain as well. They often will have fever, but not always. They will often have a high white count, but not always. They will often have vomiting, but not always. That right lower quadrant pain is that big indicator. Um, another thing that they have that trying to show you in the picture somewhat effectively um, with the basketball where it's bouncing off his knee, they can't extend that right leg all the way. Um, as they extend it, it pulls on that tissue and it, it can increase their pain. So oftentimes when patients walk in with appendicitis, they're walking kind of hunched over. They can't stand fully erect because of that right leg pulling on um, that right lower quadrant. So... Um, when do we get concerned? Well, appendicitis in and of itself is concerned, concerning and it does need to be treated. But one of the big things that we get concerned about is if it ruptures. And the way we know it has ruptured is if they feel better because it decreases that pressure on that appendix. Um, they will say they have decreased pain. They may even say they're hungry. They feel better. Um, this better isn't going to last very long because then they're going to get a rigid board like abdomen um, and become septic from the peritonitis, but we get concerned if they suddenly start feeling better. Um, how do we treat this? So surgery is the best way to treat this, and they, they can do an appendectomy um, where they remove the appendix, and it's very effective. Um, oftentimes, they just need like your perioperative antibiotics, not necessarily long-term antibiotics, unless it ruptures. Um, then it's a different story. They are kind of changing practice nowadays where they're going with more conventional routes of a wait and see um, effect where they'll, they'll give them antibiotics and wait and see if that resolves it, which it can. I, I get that you don't want to do surgery needlessly. Um, however, I've cared for patients that have a routine appendectomy that has not ruptured. That was a very easy surgery. They stay overnight and they go home versus I've had the patients that have ruptured where sometimes they are in the hospital for a couple weeks on IV antibiotics and they are very sick. Um, so I get that you know, you're trying to be more conventional and not do surgery on everybody. Um, but my personal thing is I think surgery is still the best method since it is a pretty routine surgery um, as long as the patient can tolerate um, the surgical procedure itself. So when we're talking about post-op care for these patients, um, pain is going to be a big one, although a lot of times these patients are um, feel so much better. Even their post-op pain is much less than the appendicitis pain they had ahead of time. Monitoring for complications, assessing bowel sounds. You want to make sure before you feed them or anything that you are assessing bowel sounds. Make sure they don't get an ileus or anything like that. If they did have a rupture, sometimes they will have an abdominal drain like a JP drain. Um, they'll be on antibiotics some pretty intense antibiotics for a while. So it's better to prevent that rupture um, before it happens, hopefully. So pain at McBurney's point and surgery. Um, if they feel better, that can be a sign of rupture.